North Carolina on to the Sweet 16, 85-69 over a physical Michigan State squad as they make their 31st Sweet 16 appearance. They tied a season low with five turnovers. They took care of the basketball. R.J. Davis, ACC Player of the Year, leads the way with 20 points. Armando Del Baycott with 18, seven, and two blocks. Harrison Ingram delivering 17 points. Cormac Ryan, 14 points. Um, this was about the runs that North Carolina went on. They went on a 23 to run, a three run over the final eight minutes of the first half. And then in the second half late, they went on a 19 to six run to pull away. Final score 85 69 and they remain perfect against Michigan State in the big dance. A perfect six and zero in the NCAA tournament. This tournament recap is presented by Bet MGM and North Carolina taking care of business against Michigan State. Matt, uh, you saw R.J. Davis, ACC Player of the Year, pour in 20 points. Armando Baycott with 18, and they took care of the basketball. And it was as if Michigan State just couldn't keep up at the end of the first half and late in the second half. No question. So big picture on this is UNC got to the tournament, got the final one seed. And remember, on Selection Sunday, there was curiosity if UNC would be the one seed. Well, it got it. And then what happened? It has a no doubt about it win over Wagner. And then it pulls away from Michigan State, behaving like we want to see a one seed behave. Baycott, I thought, was solid. 18 points, 7 rebounds, 5 of 10 from the field, 8 of 10 from the line, and 32 minutes of hard work against the uh, Michigan State team coming off a really, really, really impressive win over Mississippi State. Between him and then Davis, who obviously had a team-high 20, that was big. And then they kept him under a point per possession. That's been North Carolina's M.O. Way more games than not this season. It's been a really good development. UNC having a top 10 level defense here. Michigan State 0.97 points per possession in this game. They were not able to outflank them on offense. They were now able to rebound them uh, on defense and yeah, a, a turnover percentage overall. Michigan State coughed it up on 15.5% of their turnovers in this game. UNC won it today. The way that it has won a lot of games convincingly against good teams this year. A really good sign heading into the Sweet 16. Yeah, that defense, 74. That's the magic number for North Carolina. You keep them under 74, they're going to be okay. If uh, you allow the opponent to get more, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. But the thing that stands out to me and why you are buying stock coming out of the first weekend in North Carolina is because you know what you're going to get from the player of the year, R.J. Davis. And you know what you're going to get from Armando Baycott, who does look motivated here in this postseason. But to make a deep run, you need those ancillary pieces. You see Harris and Ingram come up with five big three-pointers in this game. Cormac Ryan, he knocks down a couple as well. 15 hard minutes from Jalen Withers. Uh, when you are able to bring that uh, extra scoring, when you are able to bring that extra size and physicality down low, that's how you win the rebounding margin. That's how you're able to silence any kind of hope that the opponent has from climbing back into the game. Matt, what did you learn about North Carolina, specifically in this game, against a physical Michigan State squad? Because you know that the competition will get fierce as the road continues for the Tar Heels. Yeah, I think the big lesson here is that North Carolina has had multiple situations this season. This one is as pressurized as any, obviously, because it's win or go home. But UNC, for the most part, when it has played high-level competition this season, has stepped up and passed the test and passed it with flying colors more often than not. And then here, uh, in a spot where I think we were all kind of looking around and wondering, okay, would Sparty show up for two games in a row and exhibit itself in typical Izzo fashion? Because remember, this is, this is uncommon for Tom Izzo. His record in the, in the in the second day of a two-day turnaround, either here in the second round or the Elite Eight, is the best in the history of men's D1 college basketball in the NCAA tournament era and the expansion of it since 85. And they just didn't have it there. So, yes, to me, it was reinforcement of North Carolina as a national championship contender. I think some people have been hesitant on that because they haven't been on that Purdue-UConn-Houston tier. But at this point, there, there are very few complaints. Yes, they kept it interesting early, did Michigan State. But mm -hmm. here, this was, uh, this was really, really impressive because the defense showed up again and sweltering in the second half. How much longer does Tom Izzo want to coach? Ooh. Well, that, I mean, I talked to Izzo about this on the record earlier this year. Uh, if you did miss that, he told me he's not retiring this year. So right. don't expect it. In fact, if that happens, I'm going to call him up and I'm going to chew him out because he went on the record with me first saying <laughs> he would not retire this year. So uh, I think with Izzo, it could really be, it could be a couple of years. It could be as long as five or six. Uh, he is one of the more interesting men when, when you start talking about this profession and everything that's come with it and how college basketball has changed. He still feels 
a devoted calling to the sport and to tutoring young men and, and bringing them into the world, into adulthood. Like, you know, that, yeah, I understand if you hear that kind of stuff, you can roll your eyes at it. I'm telling you, for him, it truly means something. So I personally, having after talked to Izzo about this, I'm not anticipating a retirement next year, maybe not the year after, but... Uh, who, who knows with the way the sports move. Didn't he reference Nick Saban to you? He did. Yeah, he did. so that's the, I think Tom Izzo's going to go out like Nick did, where he's doing it, he's doing it, he's doing it, and then one day he just realizes he doesn't quite have it. And it'll come like a thief in the well, night, and then all of a sudden, boom, Izzo's uh, out of the game. On that note, we joked about it when I talked to him on record. Uh, he is a guy who can absolutely retire by breakfast and sign a five-year contract by lunch. That is just who Tom Izzo is, and so it might well be that way. Hey, he will not have, I mean, he told me this as well, he's not going to have any kind of farewell tour. So, no Izzo retirement talk in 2024. It's not happening. I would push against it even happening in 2025. Michigan State now needs to hop in the portal and, uh, and, and try and rebuild this team because this was an older team. is going to lose a lot of key pieces mm -hmm. here. And how Izzo handles the portal will be an intriguing storyline moving forward because it's obviously in the context of the Big Ten, still high up there, but things can shift pretty quickly here depending on who you get and how you restock your roster. Michigan State won a national championship in 2000, so some 24 years ago. We remember Michigan State, North Carolina, the national championship in 2009, and that was a beatdown in that game in favor of North Carolina. For North Carolina now, mm. they were in the national championship a couple years ago and choked away a 15-point lead to Kansas. Mm. How much is that on the minds of the veterans like Armando Baycott, like R.J. Davis, and Hubert Davis, who got him there and said, okay, well, show me something, and we thought that team was going to win it all after getting by Duke. All right, th this, they looked... Like we all, I remember, I said it was over at halftime. Mm -hmm. And then it was the, the wildest second half I had seen in a Final Four game. It was just absolutely bonkers. How much do you think that's on their minds? I think that will be on their minds more if they make it back to the Final Four. I think this is being driven by the disappointment of last season. First ever team to be the number one team in the AP preseason poll and not even make the NCAA tournament. That has been the driving, motivating factor for this North Carolina team in this campaign pain and the way that they played against Michigan State you know you're looking at either Grand Canyon or Alabama right. like eh, it's this is a manageable path to at least set up a win in your end scenario maybe in the Elite Eight maybe it's Baylor maybe it's Caleb Love in Arizona well, we can all wait on it I know we got to get <laughs> yeah. there but yes that's 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 what way. we would that's what we would like if you if you're North Carolina you probably want Grand Canyon just based on the inexperience. Yeah. As fans, we want to, I mean, I, we want Alabama, North Carolina would be awesome. It would be. Again, we got, we got to get there. Those teams play on Sunday. Correct. We'll kind of, we'll wait and see on that. But I do think that UNC, this UNC team, I want to really uh, commend Hubert Davis and that staff for getting this group to this point. One seed level, they can win games in different kind of styles. Uh, the defense has been so reliable for the majority of the season. And then you have like RJ Davis, hello, top five player in the country, first team All-American, there's no doubt about it. And he emerged to be that star for them alongside another all-time player with Armando Baycott. I think all these things kind of playing into it gives me, I didn't pick Carolina to make the final four okay i might be i had saint i had saint mary's oh, oh don't, even, don't even start <laughs> me don't start with me on that